You are watching Forbidden Knowledge TV. the Egyptians did a lot of work. They kept it really secret. I did my post this much since that day. Wow, I started slowing down my post. <laughs> I found out that one of the tricks of the algorithm, yes. don't post as much and you'll get more views and likes. So I started slowing down my posting, where I would post five times a day, sometimes six times a day. I sort of down to two or three, and I started seeing my algorithm adjust, and I started seeing my views and likes go back up again, significantly. Like two, three hundred thousand views on the video, and I was not even an issue. So I slowed down my posting. So they changed it back, that's what I'm gonna have to do. Because these beings abducted your mom and your aunt, do you think that's why they visited you to check up on you? Uh, you know, I don't know. These were different, you know. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. That story he's talking about is an interview that I came out with after a long time deciding I wasn't ever going to talk about it, but I ended up talking about it one time, and now it's kind of become public. In 2010, um, I was working on a project, a very famous project called Fort Terranova. I built a $20 million underground shelter in northwest Georgia. It's about the size of three Walmarts all on the ground. It's called Fort Terranova. You can look it up. It was on the History Channel. It was on the History Channel. They featured me on an episode called uh, Countdown to Apocalypse. And it was the Nostradamus episode. And that was back in 2012 when it finally aired. It was filmed before then. But I was building this shelter, uh, this massive shelter, because I started researching the procession of the equinoxes, because I'm an amateur astronomer. And through the research, I realized that procession was speeding up. And I was like, wow, why would procession speed up? I mean, you know, not by a lot, but when you're racing in a race, if you come in two seconds ahead of somebody, that's a massive amount of time in a race, in a foot race, right? So procession is speeding up by two or 3,000 years. That's a massive difference. What could cause that? So I started theorizing about it. I started saying, the only way procession could speed up means our sun is probably orbiting something for breakaway speed. That would cause it to speed up, and then it would break that. It would break that orbit that it would need to take, and then it would slow down again. Then it would build a break with like you know, gravitational assist type stuff and technology. When you're talking about you know using gravitational assist to get satellites out to deep space, so I started looking into that, and I found an old documentary uh, that talked about Nemesis, and it talked about uh, it was the Golden Year, <clears throat> and um, James Earl Jones was narrating it. And it was talking about the possibility that we're living in a binary solar system. This before any new science and everything ever came out about the brown dwarf and all this other stuff. So I started thinking about this and I started uh, learning about the potential orbital rates. And I started realizing that as this object came closer to our sun, there were more geological disasters being recorded in ancient texts on the planet. And I was like, hmm, this is pretty interesting. We could be headed for a geological disaster in a couple hundred years. What can I do about it? The only thing I could think of was to build an underground shelter so that my kids' kids or whatever, or my kids, you know, even if myself, if it came early, if I was off, could survive it. So I started working on building, or the concept of building an underground shelter. I was going to use containers, shipping containers. And a friend of mine who had, who was, uh, worked at the military at a very high level with TS clearance, he told me, um, 
you don't want to do uh, shipping containers because they have 90 degree angles and underground as earth shifts, those corners will crack and then radon gases can come in and snuff you and your family out. It'll be all over. He said also you probably don't want to do something where it's just you solo because you only have a certain uh, limited amount of skills. Uh, you probably want to do something with a small community so that everybody can ship in. I was like, wow, that's a great point. So I started researching and he was like, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to give you the contact that we use when I work for Oliver North, you know who that is, uh, the U.S. military, the company we use to build the shelters for the United States military that he lived in. Uh, and in there, they had 3D printers back then. They would build an entire Jeep, he said. Everything you needed to drive the Jeep out was built on a machine in that shelter. <laughs> he gave me the number to Radius Engineering, and I contacted them, and I told them what my concept and idea was, and the guy hopped on a plane with a CFO and flew to my house the next day in Florida. So we struck a deal, we worked out a, a deal, and um, started working on Fort Terranova, which means, uh, you know, Fort is a, it's a fort, and uh, Terra means Earth, and Nova, uh, it's like, you know, supernova, in case of a, a, a disaster that I thought potentially could be caused by the sun, gravitationally, and maybe even through a, a coronal mass ejection. So that's why I named it Fort Terranova. And uh, the, it's got an underground uh, uh, river flowing there. Uh, this is why I picked that spot. Did a lot of research. Had to be 700 feet above sea level, 600 miles away from the coastline. It had to be, uh, it couldn't be downwind from any volcanic activity. Uh, it had to be uh, 300 miles away from any nuclear power plants. Uh, you had to test for radon gas and various other dangerous gases. Um, uh, contamination tests were done. Uh, the book for that shelter, which we call the Bible, is about this thick, and it cost 20000 just to get all the science to create that book. And uh, that book covers every aspect of the shelter, including every nut, every rivet, every bolt, all, all uh, you know, criteria for living there, the type of clothing, the type of material needs that you can actually wear and you can't wear in reason why, for ventilation and so forth. If a person dies, what the actual procedure is to remove the body, uh, you know, the storage containers, how to eat the food and put the waste back into the same the storage uh, containment spot. You saying, can I get a room? <laughs> <laughs> There's a 7,000 person waiting list. Yeah, well, I'm looking at doing another one. A few people have contacted me uh, with some viable locations of where I have land. And uh, so we're def definitely looking at doing another one. So I'm looking forward to, to doing another one. But during, I brought that up to say, during that time, <laughs> I don't know if it was because of this research that I was doing, but I was in my house one day after a long day of crazy work on this project, and I sat down on my couch to watch ESPN Sport Update, um, and the whole room turned lavender. And so I was like, wow, what in the hell? So I thought my kids were playing a trick on me. I thought my boys were back then. You know, I still had kids living in the house and everything. I turned over my left shoulder, nobody was there. I was like, wow, when I turned back around, right in my face, two gray aliens. Mm. Gray aliens in my face. Real as day, real as you sitting right there, they were there. I was sitting in a chair, uh, a, a, you know, a sofa couch, and sitting in a, you know, so from my height, based on how tall they were, because they were standing straight up, they couldn't have been no more than four and a half feet max. They, I couldn't tell if those were really eyes or goggles. Um, that part I couldn't tell. But they did have slits in there for ears, uh, little tiny dots for nose, and a slit for a mouth that never opened or never moved. And they had on this weird body jumpsuit. Um, but the thing that happens is, they, whatever they did, started making my brain shake. They didn't communicate with me, they didn't tell me anything like verbally that I could understand, but my, literally my head started shaking in my skull. I started trying to scream and no sound was coming. I was like, my sound's muted. And uh, it was a traumatizing experience. Um, I ran around the house, nobody heard or saw a thing. When they left, they didn't really walk like a normal person walks. They kind of have this bounce to them. It almost looked like a, like a puppeteer, you know? It wasn't like a walk. Why? No idea. I, don't, I can't even tell you what it was. But what did happen uh, is it was the, the start of the campus back <laughs> in that relationship ending. I didn't make any money because I didn't tell anybody about it um, and, um, for many years. And it RFI terrified my kids. 
um, and me, and me. And still to this day, time to time I get the shakes about thinking about it. It wasn't a pleasant experience. The other thing that did come out of it, I think, was the next day, the phrase, the words, worldwide telescope was on my mind over and over and over again, thousands of times, to the point where it became annoying. So I went to my computer and I went on Insight.com. Back then, Google was, you know, they were good, but it was still, I was still going on Insight.com. It was a search engine, and I typed in Worldwide Telescope, and the first search result was WorldwideTelescope.org, and I literally almost fell out of my chair. I was like, what? And back then, you had to download it. Now you have a choice. You can download it or you can just load it. It's a software program, but it runs on HTML5 now, so you don't have to install any software if you don't want to. I installed the software, I opened it up, and it's all the space probe data, every space mission, every probe that ever went out from Earth in that one website. All the data, I mean all of it. <laughs> I was like, wow. And the first thing I saw was um, uh, Mars panoramas. So I said, okay. Mars panoramas. Then I saw Opportunity Rover. I said, okay, Opportunity Rover. And then it takes you in like you're looking through the rover, the Opportunity Rover's eyes. Because what they've done is the Opportunity Rover is consistently taking these images on a consistent pan as it moves around. So all those images become what they call gigapans. So they take those images and they stitch them together. And you have the range and you have the panning built in to these three dimensional imagery. And it gives you the effect as if you're actually in the rover controlling it, even though it's really stitched images. It's a really amazing thing. It's open to the general population, general public. There's no money, no fee involved in this. It, uh, it's just your tax is already paid for this stuff. Every person just doesn't even know it exists. So um, as I look on these Mars panoramas, I start seeing right away anomalies, things that look out of place. And I'll show you some of those today. They didn't belong there. And I was trying to figure out why some of these things look Egyptian. Why did they look Egyptian? That was the big question. Um, and that sent me down a whole other rabbit hole because now I started going, wow, wait a minute. Megalithic structures on Earth, megalithic structures on Mars, Egyptian motif type statues on Mars, pyramids on Mars, on, on a server that contains all this information open to the general population from space probe data. So I said, there only has to be one architect. There's only one architect, and I gotta find out who this is. That sent me on my quest to find both the Atlantean. <laughs> that's how I, that's what sent me on the quest. I started researching all the ancient texts to find out if there was any account of Mars, and I found it in the Sumerian tablets. That's how I started going to the Sumerians and going to the Numeulish and the Seven Tablets of Creation, the Adra S Epic, the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, all these different ancient writings uh, from the Sumerians. And uh, that led me into the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, and the invaders. It led me into uh, the, you know, uh, all the ancient scriptures and, and stuff, and, you know, Nag Hammadi scripts and all this stuff. And eventually, it, and I ended up at the Emerald Tablets. And that's when I said, wow, bingo, I found it. I found the architect. This was the architect, the master architect that laid down the floor plan for these types of structures to be built, not only around the entire planet Earth, as he said, he ordered people to do, but also throughout the entire solar system, and maybe even beyond. So that's how I, you know, that's how I came across it. So if anything that I got out of that experience was, it sent me down the rabbit hole into finding or searching for space anomalies. I then later formed the United Family of Anomaly Hunters, which uh, their press release went global, and our search for extraterrestrial life uh, not only on Earth, but also in our solar system, based off of official space probe data from multiple space agencies. And to date, we've downloaded over a million images from the space agencies, and we've now documented over 58,000 anomalies, uh, things that don't belong on these particular planets and moons in our solar system. We've covered Venus. Hi, I'm Billy Carson, researcher, speaker, and best-selling author of the Compendium of the Emerald Tablets and Woke Doesn't Mean Broke. I'm inviting you to join me on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv to enjoy hours of great programming, 
Learn the secrets of ancient Egypt, unexplained structures on the moon and Mars, financial literacy, holistic and healthy lifestyles. Go now to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv and get three days free. While there, you can enter to win a Rolls Royce. That's ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. You are watching Forbidden Knowledge TV. Hi, my name is Billy Carson, and I'm the president of Forbidden Knowledge. We have an amazing investment opportunity here for anyone who wants to buy shares in Forbidden Knowledge. The money that's generated from this crowdfunding platform is going to be used to bring on a new content acquisitions partner. We're going to hire a new in-house graphics designer, a social media manager, a put together a customer service team and a customer service management program that will organize and satisfy all the different legs of Forbidden Knowledge Inc. As well as, and of course, make more improved high quality streaming content for the Forbidden Knowledge TV platform, which right now is featured on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, iOS and Android apps, and also of course, the web. The streaming platform is a year old right now and doing very, very well. And we're looking for your support where you can not only be a conscious customer, but also be a part owner in an amazing opportunity that includes streaming TV, book publishing, and e-commerce. Grow with us and earn with us. Forbidden Knowledge Inc. You are watching Forbidden Knowledge TV.